Yeah, I'm going to get on to our fifth lesson, and it's the fourth offering that uh, the uh, Jews were required to give, recorded in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. So uh, that's uh, what we're in uh, Leviticus chapter 4 today. If you have your Bible, that's where we're going to eventually go, okay? So let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Father, we uh, pause this morning to just thank you for your love and your care for us. It's amazing to realize that we have a personal God and a personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Where would we be without Jesus? We would have nothing without him. So Father, we worship you and we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. And now this morning I pray that you will, uh, you will capture our minds. Your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and help us to understand these things that are somewhat complicated to read, but wonderful when we study them and understand what they're saying. So Father, we just uh, give ourselves to you for that. Pray that you will guide us as we go, that your Holy Spirit will uh, be our teacher, and we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, in a presidential election, where George W. Bush was one of the contenders, uh, a reporter in Portland, Maine, overheard talking in the courthouse. George W. Bush had had a DUI in 1976. That was 24 years before the presidential election. He had had a DUI. And uh, this became very big news as the presidential campaign uh, entered the last full week. They discovered this. And the point is, uh, not what he did 24 years ago, George W. Bush had admitted that he had a number of youthful indiscretions, as he put it. Uh, but they were suspecting him of cover-up. What else is he covering up, is the question. And they hoped to you know, derail him with this kind of a thing, but it didn't. And uh, they were accusing him of being a deceiver. It's not what he did, it's who he was. That was the issue. And that's the nature of the sin offering that we come to today. It's not what we did. It's who we are. That also has to be cared for. And that's going to be our study today. What is the sin offering? Now we've looked at the uh, sweet savor offerings. There were three of them, the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. And uh, they, the burnt offering dealt with uh, all the sins that we uh, uh, omitted, in other words, we're to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. Have you ever done that? All? None of us have. Sins of omission, and Jesus did. And we're, his death on the cross, the burnt offering signifies that's one of the things he died for, that he did it all, and we are seen as having done it all in him. And it's a phenomenal thing. And the meal offering is the second part of the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And it doesn't have any blood, it's all a grain from the ground, and it all represents the human aspect of things. And it's uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. And that is always, at all times. Uh, have you ever done that? Well, me neither. You know, and so Christ did. He always gave of himself to everyone he was ministering with, and they loved him for it. That is, the general populace did. And uh, he did that, and he, one of the aspects of his death was providing for us the sins of omission that we had done, not caring for our neighbors ourselves. And so the whole first commandment, love God and then love your neighbor, is fulfilled in the death of Christ. And the result of that is peace with God, which is why there's a third offering, the peace offering. And that's all about having perfect peace with God. Now, God loves this. All these three offerings are said to be sweet to God. A sweet-smelling savor. Smelling an aroma that really pleases Him. 
These are the sweet savor offerings. They satisfy God's holy requirements. The first big commandment and then having peace with him. The good things we didn't do. Some say the sins of omission are the sins we should have done but didn't do. That's not true. It's the uh, good deeds we didn't do. So they are provided for us in the death of Christ. And then there are the, uh, the sacrifices that deal with the sins of commission. The sins we actually did do, and these are the last two. There are three in the first set, non or sweet savor offerings, and then two in the last set, which are non-sweet savor. Now, it's never said that these are non-sweet savor offerings in the text. It's just that that's left out. It's not there. And so, since the first three are specifically said to be sweet savor offerings, we assume that the last three are not sweet savor offerings. And they deal with satisfaction of God's just demands. Uh, these are the bad things we did do, and what we're accountable to God for. And it's not pleasing to God to uh, bring judgment on his people. And so these are non-sweet savor offerings, but these are things that Christ did when he died on the cross so that we not only have our sins of omission cared for, but we also have our sins of commission cared for. So that's the order. The first three are the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. And God's first concern is doing what is right. And that's what those cover. Sins of omission, the basis for all of our other problems. I tell a story in my book, When uh, Life's a Wreck. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this down in the bookstore, When Life's a it's a, it's an autobiography of myself. Not really, uh, but When Life's a Wreck. Uh, but uh, in that, I tell a story of a young man in Stoughton, Wisconsin, when I was pastoring there. He was in my congregation, and he got married. And he was newly married, and he told his wife on one occasion that he was just going out and uh, with friends. And in actuality, he went to the roller rink, which was his hangout, before he got married. And uh, he would try to pick up girls and whatever at the roller rink. And he went back over to the roller rink, and uh, he... Uh, did pick up a girl. He was married now, remember, and he picked up a girl and they got in his car and they went to a, a local county park, what they usually go to to make out, you know, to park the car and do the thing, you know. And it was uh, evening, it was beginning to get dark, and they parked and they were doing this. And uh, the police car, just on his regular patrol, came in and they shined the lights around and they signed the lights on the car. And the girl in the car panicked. And she jumped out of the car and she began yelling rape. So the police arrested him. And I got a call, I was his pastor, and I got a call, come see me, I'm in the jail, I'm in trouble. And when I saw him, he said to me, I wish I had done what I said I was going to do. I never would have gotten into this mess if I had. And those are the first offerings. I wish I'd have done what I was supposed to do. I never would have gotten into all the mess that I'm in. But that leads to the non-sweet savor offerings, the sin offering and the trespass offering. And the sin offering deals with who we are. And the trespass offering deals with the sins that we commit because of who we are. So, we, are, we sin because we're sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. You understand that? It's who we are. And Matthew 7 says, A good tree brings forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree brings forth bad fruit. And the point of it is, by your fruit you shall know them. And uh, we're a bad tree, and that's why we uh, bring forth bad fruit at times. If you never committed a sinful act, you would still be condemned by a holy God because you are a child of Adam and therefore a sinner by nature. We need to understand that. It's who we are that's the biggest problem. 
And it's out of that that we do all of the crazy things that we do that displease God. So every sin we commit is simply a ratification of who we are. The non-sweet savor offerings, the sin offering on one si uh, side, and the trespass offering on the other side. Uh, and they're really simultaneous. That's one offering uh, of Jesus. He only died once, but he covered both of these areas. These are two shadows of the cross. And the first is uh, our individual situation. We're not perfect. Uh, it's who we are. And the other is our iniquities. It's what we do. By nature, we are a sinner. That's the sin offering. And our actions, we commit sin, and that's the trespass offering. The uh, sin offering, the nature of what we are, it's called the old man in the scriptures. I'm an old man, but it's not referring to that. Um, it's the old man within us. Okay, and that's uh, where we, we inherit the sin nature from Adam. Uh, one of the passages that deals with that, and before we get to uh, chapter 4 of Leviticus, I want to direct your attention to Romans 5 for a moment. And this is where it explains it pretty clearly that uh, we are sinners because we are in Adam. He's the federal head of the human race. Therefore, everyone born of his lineage, and we all are, we're all children of Adam, uh, that we inherit who he is, and so we have a sin nature. But in Romans 5, 12 and following, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, now that's Adam, and death by sin, so death principle invaded his body, and uh, years later he did die. And so death passed upon all men, all human beings, for all have sinned. We sinned in the loins of Adam. That's how God sees it. He's the federal head, like we have a federal government and our representatives represent us. And, and so we may not agree with what they do, but they represent us anyway. And so that's, uh, we're guilty of what they decide on our behalf. But anyway, that was Adam. He was the federal head, and he is our parent, and he, uh, he committed sin. And so he died, and now we all will die too. That's why we die. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. This is Romans 5 still. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And then it says in verse 15, for if through the offense of one, many are dead. The offense of Adam, we all die. It says in verse 16, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. That was Adam. We're all condemned in Adam. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense sense, death reigned by one, everyone dies. The statistics on death are pretty high. You know, we all do it, you know, and uh, we all die. That's because of Adam. Verse 18, as if by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So we're all condemned because of Adam. And verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By Adam's disobedience, all of us were made sinners. That's Romans 5. And that's the basic idea here, that we are inheritors of Adam's nature, which is a sinful nature, and that is what uh, has to be cared for. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, uh, Knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified with him. It's not talking about blood at this point. It's talking about crucifixion. It is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. That is, our body of sin is destroyed in the death of Christ. He died for us, the sin offering. Uh, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And that's Romans 6 really sets us up for how we have victory in the Christian life because we're to reckon ourselves dead unto sin but alive unto God. And when we do the reckoning, you know, then we uh, mortify the deeds of the flesh, and it's all part of the crucifixion that we have with Christ. 
in a sense, all Christians are dead people walking. Not the TV series, but uh, dead people walking. And we really, uh, in Christ, are considered by God to have already died. The cross cares for our old nature. Now when we come to the trespass offering, uh, that's in the plural, sins. In 1 John 1 verses 9 and 10, if we confess our sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, plural, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the sins are the things that we commit and the sinful deeds. And Hebrews 9.22 says that uh, and above almost all things are by the law purged by blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. So it's the blood that cares for our sins. It's the cross that cares for our sinfulness, our old nature. So that's an introduction to the sin offering. We're dealing with who we are now in this offering. So page two of our notes. Leviticus 4. And uh, let me just read the first two verses here to get us going. Leviticus 4 verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance. You might have wondered what that meant when you were reading through Leviticus. Through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. And then he talks about four different categories of people that do that, the priest and the congregation and then the ruler and the people. And he deals with all four of those and we'll look at those in a moment. But I want to give you some observations about this offering first. An offering for unintentional sin. That's said in every respect. With the priest, it says, uh, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring forth his sin offering, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish in the Lord for a sin offering. And he had done what is unintentional. That's in verse 2, verse uh, 13, which is the congregation. He says in verse 13, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which should not be done, and are guilty. So this is ignorance. You don't even know you've committed it. And uh, that's what these are dealing with. Or look at verse 22 with the uh, ruler. It says, when a ruler hath sinned and hath done through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty. If you sin through ignorance, you're still guilty. Or you look in uh, uh, verse 27 with the common people. If any one of the common people sin through ignorance, well, he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty. It's kind of like our jurisprudence system. If you uh, calculate uh, a murder and you really uh, work at uh, getting it done, then that's first degree murder and you are, um, you know, you are a, a death penalty or the worst of, con of uh, condemnations. But if you happen to kill somebody you didn't intend to and it was unintentional on your part that's called manslaughter and that doesn't have nearly the penalty that first degree murder does and that's like this when you do something unintentionally you're still guilty a person who commits manslaughter still goes to jail you're still guilty and so whether it's the priest the congregation the religious sector, or the ruler, and the people, the political section, uh, if we sin through ignorance, then we are still guilty. So this is talking about who we are. You sin through ignorance. It's just who you are. You just happen to do it, and it happened. And uh, the offender is sinning and doesn't know it, but still a sin against God. See, the emphasis is on the sinner's nature. Sins committed are the proof that the nature is there. 
Not acts of deliberate sin, not blatant aggressive sin, but unintentional sin. Even when he doesn't intend to, he still does because he is a sinner. It's his nature. That's the problem. Okay? You following that so far? The second observation, the offering is a matter of substitution. The offerer lays his hands on the substitutionary animal. Now look at verse 4 with regard to the priest. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. He lays his hand on the head of the bull, and that bull is now in his place. Uh, his sins are transferred to the bull, that is, figuratively speaking. The bull is innocent, but the, he now has the sins of the man on him, and that's why he's going to be killed. In his place, it's a substitutionary atonement. Or verse 15, this is the, uh, uh, the whole congregation. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord. And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. So there with the, uh, the congregation, it's the same thing. They lay their hands on the animal. Or uh, you look at verse 24. Uh, this is where the, uh, the ruler, uh, the goat is killed in place of the ruler and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it. And verse 29, and this is with the common people, uh, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering. Then you come down to verse 33 as a, a conclusion, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering. So this is uh, identifying with the offering. The ruler or the priest or the congregation or the common people it's always laying the hand on it so that the sins are transferred and they're dying in its place. This is illustrated in the Yom Kippur uh, Day of Atonement offering. That only happened once a year. It's a sin offering. And uh, I took a quote out of uh, a, a book, The Feast of the Lord by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. And that's sold downstairs in the, in the bookstore. The Feast of the Lord, and they have a, a statement with regard to the, the, the goats, the two goats that were part of the sin offering. It says, the two golden lots were placed inside a golden vessel sitting on the stone uh, pavement nearby. One was inscribed with, for Yahweh, and the other with, for Azazel. The high priest shook the vessel and randomly took out lots by hand, and as he held the lots to the foreheads of the goats. So this was uh, um, for the goats' sake. I mean, this was the Lord determining it was uh, by, uh, by lot. And one was going to die, and the other was going to be uh, set free. But uh, I'll show you in a moment what that means. And the high priest shook the vessel, randomly took a lot at each hand. As he held the lots to the foreheads of the uh, goats, and determined the outcome, he declared them a sin offering to the Lord. The two goats together were viewed as one singular offering that were two parts to it. They go on to say then, attention was then drawn to the remaining goat as it stood in the afternoon sun, nervously twitching its ears and staring at the congregation. The high priest proceeded to lay his hand on its head and confess the sins of the people upon it. Now this is at Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And uh, uh, the sins of the people upon it, the scapegoat as it was then called, was led through the eastern gate by a priest more than 10 miles into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And that's the scapegoat. He was released, but that was a symbol of the fact that our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west, as the scripture says. And uh, there's a death on our behalf, but then our sins are separated from us, and that's the scapegoat that's let out in the wilderness and uh, never see it again. Who knows what happens to it, eaten by another, or just died and laid down and died, or whatever. But 10 miles out into the wilderness. And that's Yom Kippur. But that's the sin offering, okay? Uh, a perfect substitute. Substitution demanded perfection. So, uh, a perfect substitute. In verse 3, it says of the priest that is anointed, uh, it says, uh, let him bring for his sin, which hath, he hath sinned, a young bullock 
without blemish. Okay, got that? No blemish. Now that's not perfectly without blemish. It's uh, visibly not, it didn't have any blemishes. Or verse 23, which talks about the ruler. It says uh, he is to bring a kid, uh, a male, without blemish. Verse 28, which talks about the uh, common people. And uh, a kid, a goat, a female, without blemish. And then it's repeated again in verse 32. And if you bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. No blemish in the goat. Uh, this was the problem at the uh, temple with the sellers of animals. Remember when Jesus went in and drove out the sellers of animals? And they changed money first, and they defrauded the people when they did that. But they had to get temple currency instead of regular currency, so they had them all for a barrel. And if they're going to, they brought their goat, and they just automatically said, oh, that goat's got blemishes in it. You got to buy our goat. So then they'd have to buy it, and they'd have to have the money to do it, and that was the money changers. And then the sellers of animals, they would sell their goat. That was the perfect goat that could go. And that was the whole uh, fraudulent thing that the uh, Sadducees were pulling on the people at the time. But they, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. Uh, it's said of Christ in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Just. Christ was just. He was the perfect sacrifice. No blemish in him. And he became our sacrifice. He is righteous. And bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And that's 1 Peter 3.18. The animal had to be without defect to be offered in place of the sinner. And that's exactly what Christ was when he died and paid the sin offering and died a perfect sacrifice for us. And then it had to be the death of the substitute. In verses 4, 15, 24, 29, 33, it says the substitute is killed. And in 1 Peter 3, 18, it says that Christ once suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring, uh, bring us to God being put to death in the flesh. Christ had to die for the, the sin offering to be fulfilled. So the wages of sin is death, and so all of us will die, and Christ died for us so that our death will be only physical, it will not be spiritual, because Christ died for us, and we are considered as having our debt paid because we're in Christ, and he was our sin offering for us. So you follow all of that, the observations, an offering for unintentional sin, the offering is a matter of substitution, okay? Now, you'll also notice uh, uh, that uh, in verse 3, it's a bullock for the priest and for the congregation. They had to bring a bull. But for the ruler and the common people, the ruler brought a male goat, and the people brought a female goat. So these are the animals that are offered. The next thing about this offering is that the body of the sacrificial animal had to be burnt outside of the camp. Now when we studied the sweet savor offerings, they were always offered on the altar, the brazen altar, the first thing you saw when you came into the temple or tabernacle area. And that was a symbol of acceptance to be sacrificed there. But the sin offering had to be done outside the camp. When the sweet savor offerings were done, the ashes from that were taken outside the camp, and where the ashes were put is where this sacrifice, the sin offering, was done. So it was burnt outside the camp. Uh, that's a symbol of rejection, cast out of God's presence. A unique aspect of the sin offering. When Jesus was crucified, he said, My God, my God, why have you rejected me? Why have you... Uh, rejected me and uh, he was not accepted even by God in that sense and it had to be outside the wall. Hebrews 13 verses 10 to 13 says we have an altar of which they have no right to eat who serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned where? Outside the camp. 
Wherefore Jesus also, when he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So there's a reproach about being outside the camp. When Christ died at Golgotha, he was literally outside of the city. That's what it says in Hebrews 13, that he was sacrificed outside the gate. Uh, if you go as a tourist to Israel, you'll see two different sites for the death of Christ heralded to you. One is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the other is Gordon's Calvary. And uh, if you can go up on the north wall, and there's a walkway on the north wall, and I've been up there many times, and you can look off of that right down on the bus station, which is at the foot of Golgotha there, and you can see the rock quarry behind it and the face that looks like a skull. Uh, and uh, so you're looking at the rock quarry uh, where they would stone people to death. But it's a bus station, it's a very uh, common thoroughfare, and it's a roadway. And they always, the Romans always crucified uh, their uh, main enemies, which were crucified, on a thoroughfare in public. So that people could come by and they could, uh, you know, uh, mock them and uh, curse them and all of that. And so there's this church and then a little way from it is a garden and that's where the garden tomb they found. And so Gordon's Calvary has a lot to commend it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, Church of Holy Sepulchre, you go into that and it doesn't give you any feeling at all of the natural. Uh, but they claim that the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre was really outside the wall in the Byzantine area and they, when they rebuilt and added walls. And so uh, they claim that. And now there's about five different religions that claim the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you know, and so they all claim it. and. Uh, and then they got this box in there, it's kind of a little room and you go in it and it's got all kinds of stuff in it and candles burning and that's supposed to be the grave where Jesus was buried. You just don't get a feel for it in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, so that's why uh, so many of the uh, tours will lead you to Gordon's Calvary because that really has the feel of it and it really has a lot to commend it. There are many even good scholars that claim that it was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and that was outside the wall. So. Uh, there you have Golgotha literally outside the city. Christ was not crucified on the altar of the temple. He was rejected from that. He, they wouldn't kill him there. Christ bore our sin and our rejection. This is what we deserve. We are the sinners. We're really, he's taking our place where we should be. And uh, he bore our sin and rejection. It's really a rejection of Christ that he was crucified outside of the city walls. So the carcass of the animal had to be burned outside the wall. And the body was, and there are some other things that happened in the next part that tell us the variations of uh, the thing, the blood and the fat and the body and all that, but the body was burned outside the wall. Number four, variations in the sin offering. The blood was sprinkled on two of the altars. Uh, the blood was sacred, Life is in the blood. Christ shed his blood for us. Atonement for sins. And uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And so the bullock, it says in verses 5 to 7, uh, the blood is sprinkled on the altar of incense as well as the brazen altar. So the place in the brazen altar where all the sacrifices were sacrificed, the blood was put there, sprinkled on the ground. And then it was in the altar of incense, it was sprinkled there, and then on the horns of that altar, it's a golden altar inside the holy place, and the blood was sprinkled there. In the goats, which was the rulers and the, uh, uh, and the common people, uh, the blood was only put on the brazen altar and was not put on the altar of incense. But uh, the altar of incense, intercession with God, the brazen altar, was where the atonement took place. And so the blood was put there. That's one specific of this offering. Then the second is the fat that was burned on the, uh, on the brazen altar. One aspect of this offering was offered on the brazen or the bronze altar. And that was the fat the fat of the animal, the fat on the liver, the uh, 
all the fat inside was put on it as well. And, and uh, we saw in the peace offering that the fat symbolized prosperity and provision for life. And so all of our uh, prosperity, everything we would claim, that's burned up on the altar. And uh, the fat is put on this brazen altar. All belongs to the Lord, therefore it's given back to the Lord. And that's what the prosperity or the fat symbolized. And there are the verses 8 to 10, 19, 26, 35. In verse 31, there's an interesting uh, uh, comment on this. He shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from the, off the sacrifice of the peace offering. So just like the peace offering. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. So there's one aspect of the, uh, the uh, sin offering that is a sweet savor. And that's when the fat is being burned on the brazen altar along with the peace offering, which has all the fat of the animal burning on the altar. So the fat is burned on the brazen altar, but the body of the, ca the, uh, uh, the carcass, the body, is burned outside the camp. And uh, that's a symbol of our old Adamic nature. And the body is burned outside the camp. So when the body is burned outside the camp, there's no fat on it. Well, that kind of caused me to think back to Psalm 22, which talks about the crucifixion of Christ in a very special way. And it says in verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet uh, hundreds of years before Christ uh, actually was crucified, before they even invented, uh, before the Persians and the uh, Assyrians even invented crucifixion. They pierced my hands and my feet in Psalm 22, which is a Davidic Psalm. And then verse 17, I can count all my bones. They stare and uh, gloat over me. When Christ died outside the gate, there was no fat on him. All his bones could be seen. They, uh, they stare and uh, gloat upon me. So just like the sin offering, uh, all the fat was uh, eliminated and uh, burned on the brazen altar. And so he was the symbol of the sin offering burned outside the camp. And then it's symbolic of our Adamic nature, the old man uh, being uh, burned outside the camp. The sinner's body, Romans 7, 24 to 25, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And so uh, that's our condition in Romans 7. Christ's sacrifice, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. So our bodies are crucified with Jesus' body. If you didn't have a body, you wouldn't sin. Uh, so, uh, you know, but uh, that's where our bodies are cared for. They're cared for at the cross. And the old nature is crucified with Christ, therefore our sinful condition is totally cared for. Now it's a matter of our sins, not our sin. One last page, page four. There are two divisions that I've already mentioned. That is the uh, religious division of the priests and the congregation and the political division, which is the rulers and the common people. And so they are represented by two sacrificial animals, the bullock with division one of the religious leaders and uh, the goat being the animal for the, uh, the secular political rulers. Uh, in division two. So the applications first, the priest and the congregation. This is the first one. Verses two to 12 is the priest. Verses 13 to 21 is the congregation. And uh, this is the religious side of things, religious orientation. You know, religion put Jesus on the cross. Uh, it wasn't just the Jews, it was the Jews' religion put Jesus on the cross self-righteous sinners. You know, there's an amazing statement that Paul makes in 1 Timothy 1.15. 
where he said, uh, he's talking about salvation by grace. And he says, uh, of whom I am chief. Now, Paul was an amazing guy. And yet he saw himself as the chief of sinners. Why? Well, when the uh, religious Sadducees and Pharisees were clamoring about for all of that, they were pretending to be right. They were filled with self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is putting yourself in the place of God and you're as righteous as God is righteous, so I feel pretty good about myself. Look at what I do. And that's the religious perspective. And that's what Paul was doing. When he was going around killing all the Christians, he thought he was doing good. He thought he was fulfilling the law, that he could put Christians to death. And he felt self-righteous. In fact, uh, he says in Philippians, he says, uh, well, consider me, man. I was uh, the tribe of Benjamin, and the, you know, and I'm from the uh, stock of Israel, and uh, as fulfilling the law, perfect, and he saw himself as perfect before the law, and he was gloating over that. He was proud of what he was doing, and yet he was totally wrong, and yet he was prideful. That's why self-righteousness is the worst sin. It's putting yourself in the place of God where what you do is commended. And we all need to think about that with regard to our religion, whatever it is. Religion will kill you. A relationship with Christ is what sets you free. But religion will kill you. And you become a religious person and you gloat over the fact that you do this and you do that, and you know, and you think God likes you pretty much today because you did what was right and all that. That, that's, uh, that's terrible because that's putting ourselves in the place of God. And that is the chief sin, to pretend that you're righteous. And that's why Paul calls himself a chief of sinners. It was religion that killed Jesus. Second, the ruler and the common people. This is where the goat comes in, verses 22 to 26, the ruler, and verses 27 to 35, the common people. Secular orientation, self-determined sinners, independence from God, manipulating our destiny. And uh, we think we're really something that way. You know, I remember, used to see a bumper sticker. I don't see it anymore. Probably that's good. But I thought it was always terrible. Or it said, uh, God is my co-pilot. That is pretty arrogant, you know. <laughs> I'm the one piloting this thing, you know, and God's just my co-pilot. You know, well, even in secular orientation, people say that. You have the male goat in verse 23, that's a symbol of authority. With the people in verses 28 to 32, that's a female goat, that's a symbol of submission. Christ, similar condemnation from the civil rulers. It was Pilate that put Jesus on the cross. It was Rome that put Jesus on the cross. You see, it was both. It was both the religious and the political or secular. So it is here that our old nature is crucified and that's getting to the root of our problem. When the old nature is crucified, that's what deals with what's called original sin, our sin in Adam. It's not what the Catholic Church says, that infant baptism erases uh, original sin. Infant baptism can't erase anything. And uh, it's, it's the cross that takes care of our relationship to Adam. And so uh, our lost estate without merit, and that's the original sin. And the answer is the cross. We're crucified with Christ. Let me just share with you a couple of things about that. Crucifixion was reserved for rebellious slaves and, uh, and uh, mutinous troops and vile criminals and insurrectionists. And uh, they wanted a special death for them that put them to shame and public display. And that's why crucifixion was invented by the Persians and then by the Assyrians and then uh, the Thracians and even Greece crucified people. Alexander the Great uh, crucified uh, 2,000 people from Phoenicia along the shores of uh, the Mediterranean when he conquered uh, Tyre. And uh, so they, you know, they, they all did it, crucifixion, but the whole point of it was to put them on, to, on display. 
Uh, it's kind of like uh, the killer cat in the Old West that's been killing the cattle and killing the goats and all of that. And they're really anxious to get this cat because sometimes it even comes in and takes the kids and kills them. And, and they're really angry at this cat. So they go out and they hunt and they kill the cat. And then they take the carcass of the cat and they bring it into town, into the center of town, and they string it up on a pole. And that's where you get the term pole cat. And uh, the cat that's going to be shamed. And the people could come by and hit it, spit at it, slap it, curse at it, just like they did to Jesus when they spit on him and cursed him and so forth. He was on a public display. And it says in Galatians 3 and verse 13, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. It's a matter of curse. That's a tremendous curse upon us. Uh, in the book of Joshua, when um, Joshua conquered Ai finally, uh, he hung uh, the king of Ai on a tree all day and then took him down so the people could curse him. Uh, when the five kings of the south resisted Joshua, and were found in a cave and he brought them out and he killed them. He took their carcasses and he put them on five trees. Why do they put them up on trees? It's not Christmas, they don't have ornaments on trees. He up there to, for the people to curse. It's like the polecat coming by to slap, hit, curse, punch, whatever, to take your uh, frustrations out on this person who was a vile criminal against the insurrection of the, of the state. Christ is our substitute. He hung on a tree. See, it wasn't just that he was crucified and shed his blood. He shed his blood from the Garden of Gethsemane through the courtyard of uh, Pilate when he was scourged and all the way to the cross where they nailed uh, spikes in his hands and feet and a crown of thorns that brought blood out of his brow. I mean, he shed blood for us, but he also hung on a tree. And the people came by and they reviled him. They mocked him because that was the purpose of it. And folks, that's us. He's in our place. We deserve that. On your best day, you deserve that because of your insurrection against the kingdom of God. And we begin to see in the sin offering a deeper level of sin and the need for the crucifixion to hang on a tree uh, to care for that, for the old man, that it would be crucified and we would be crucified with Christ. So, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I keep on living, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it's the cross that deals with your sinfulness. It's the blood or your condition of sin. It's your blood that deals with the actual sins that you commit. So this is the sin offering. It's a very specific offering and it has a lot of specifics to it that really flesh it out. And I hope you see that a little better now and realize just how bad we really are even on our best day. You know, it says in uh, Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What's the next phrase? Despising the shame. That's the cross aspect. Enduring the cross and despising the shame. He counted it as nothing, and yet it was everything. Taking our shame upon himself. That's, our, that's why our whole hope is in Christ. Everything about us demands the need for Christ because we are wholly deserving of the sin offering. Okay, Father, thank you for this study and I pray you'll just seal it to our hearts. Help us to understand these things and that we might reflect upon them and realize that our whole hope is in Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. We worship him as we worship the entire trinity of, uh, you know, of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet Christ is the one who is the one who stands in our place and provided for us and was our sin offering. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.